Hello, everyone. Uh, we're here to talk about virtual session on ARM V8 and how it can be used for different things, security. So, the uh, I guess every one of you knows the Linux KVM and its history. KVM for ARM V8 came about about 2013 or so and finally stabilizing around 2015. Uh, we have been working with mobile chipsets for quite a long while. And around this time, the virtual session features slowly started to emerge in the in mobile chipsets and around 2018 or so it started to look like that it might be uh, complete enough to actually try to make KVM work on a mobile phone. Prior to that it was primarily used for controlling all sorts of device accesses and, and memory accesses of the, the uh, underlying Linux system. So there was some support for virtualization features, but it was limited. And around 2018 or so in the first was when we noticed on the first chipsets that it, it's starting to look complete. Uh, at that time, we started a quick study on how complete the support is. It seemed good and true. A couple of quirks. We got it going later that year so we got basic KVM going on a mobile phone for the first time it was kind of a proof of concept for all this work that we're about to present here last year Google delivered you a talk about the matter bringing virtualization to the masses which was excellent that Google had noticed the same thing that the virtualization starts to work and it will eventually be highly useful in the mobile realm as well but at that time already, we had been focusing already quite some time on KVM and its security and how to make it a real product on a mobile phone. So ultimately, everyone wants a secure virtualization. And the way that Linux KVM itself is, is highly functional for embedded world and mobile space, but it really adds pretty little to the security. So if you ever compromise the host running KVM guests, compromising the host is enough and you get access to all the memory in the system and you can modify the guests whatever way you want. You can read and write their memory in entirety. All hope is lost in the security sense. Then KVM has, for mobile use, KVM has this limitation that it's designed to own the entire CPU hypervisor mode. Unfortunately, as I said, there were already hypervisors in existence on mobile chipsets by 2018 or so, and they were controlling majority of the device accesses for the host OS. And a lot of that stuff is really unmovable. It cannot be taken out. It has to stay there. So this kind of a clashes with the KVM's design and KVM uh, like that doesn't really work in the mobile. Uh, external hypervisors have to suffer from the same issue. So they are designed to own this entire CPU mode. Moreover, they bring more to the table. They are usually fully blown operating systems that require extensive porting efforts between the mobile be, between the uh, socks in question. Like in, in mobile phones, our average lifespan is really small. So it's two to four years. And if you have to do major porting effort between, between iterations of mobile phones, then your virtualization solution is doomed. So what we cr cr wanted to create here is something that is minimally portable between the environments. Uh, that ultimately the goal was that we wouldn't need any other uh, BSP board support package for our 
virtualization solution apart from the Linux itself. So, okay, the vendor usually, regardless of not, they provide virtualization, they are more or less mandated to bring KVM in, at least in the source form. It may not function and probably doesn't function in the code, for example, you get from Qualcomm, but at least it is there and it's kind of a major, it, it, it usually builds it at least. So there is something in there. Then the problem with this uh, external hypervisors also is that they end up making the swapping dysfunctional. So it, they waste a lot of space, memory space, but meaning the guests permanently in the memory. We don't really have that much memory on some of these embedded devices that we run, so we have to allow some form of swapping and we really prefer to do it without having to write an entire operating system and just use the Linux itself for it. Linux is ported, so make it just work and do that job. So our goal for this whole work was to create a kernel memory protection framework. This was in existence already before 2018, so we can lock pieces of kernel memory and make sure that certain things in the kernel cannot be modified by the attacker. So if somebody gets access to kernel, at least some things we can expect to stay the same. Then ARMV architecture is nicely layered security. So each, uh, each layer has considerable security value and KVM's design has the flaw that it kind of blends two of these security layers into one EL2 and EL1 layers that I mean, will slow, slowly shortly explain are more or less the same in the security sense, but we wanted to make them actually separate, just like the ARMv8 architect in the internet. And then we wanted to support KVM guests that are properly isolated from the host so that the host and the guest cannot read and write each other's memory beyond any of the shared areas. Uh, this is highly useful feature for things like secure browsing and chatting and things like that, even on the mobile. Then we wanted to create a tiny kernel intrusion detection framework so we can make measurements of the kernel memory at certain points in time. So there's the rough goal we wanted to do. And then this whole talk is a kind of a project plan on a high level. It it explains step by step what we had to modify to get there and each and, and send questions through the chat if something is unclear if we're going too fast during the talk so but first we have to start from kind of explaining the arm terms the way that they are used here unless and I think most of you are not familiar with the arm we had itself in detail so Yanni will start by explaining the terminology here and how the virtualization works on the architecture. Thanks, Yanni. Hi, everyone. Um, in ARM architecture, um, the execution is uh, divided in, uh, in a different um, privilege levels called exception levels. And there are four different exception levels in, in the ARM architecture. Going from zero to three, three being the, the most privileged. And the, the higher privilege level always have access to all the features of the lower level, but not vice versa. Next slide. Another important feature in, in the ARM architecture in addition to the exception levels is the two-stage uh, memory translation where the virtual addresses seen by the operating system is translated to a physical address through uh, a second stage of uh, address translation which is uh, controlled by the hypervisor mode. And this makes it possible to have uh, several isolated operating systems in the same system, 
like we see in the, in the next slide. So in this slide, we see that uh, there are two operating systems running on the same system, isolated from each other, and, and the hypervisor controls the intermediate physical address space for both of those different operating systems. And whenever the context is switched from one operating system to another operating system, the hypervisor does the context switching by, by uh, setting the, the base address of the second stage translate and translation table to correspond the running guest. Next slide, I think I'm handing back to Janne at this point. Yeah, so in order to go towards this kind of uh, uh, secure, uh, secure uh, proper host guest separation for visualization, the first thing we had to do is that we had to create prelays to hide stuff. So we had to create a tiny hypervisor executable that can take ownership of some of the kernel functions. Uh, this comes to the, the first requirements for this thing is that it has to be compatible with uh, almost any form of uh, translations in existence. So you can have, as you can know, as you know, you can have table walks of different lengths. So you can walk to table levels three or four, and you can have all sorts of diff different block size mappings and everything. Our hypervisor, since it, it has to be compatible with the KVM itself, and it has to be compatible with third-party hypervisors, has to be able to understand it all. So it requires pretty extensive mapping code. Then, of course, it has to be able to record all the guest information, the run state and the memory layout and everything of the guest. It has to have all the plumbing to handle, trap and handle all the relevant exceptions. And since this thing is uh, getting stuff like the guest information, guest kernel and guest images and guest pages and things like that through an insecure transit path, being the host kernel, then it has to be able to perform signature checks and integrity measurements of the data coming in. This table walk is another element that I'll explain a tiny bit later on, but it has to be basically, it has to be able to make sense of uh, the entire uh, device memory on anyone's behalf. So it has to be able to translate from process X's page into actual physical page what it happens to be even though it's it's controlled by the uh, insecure linux host all the, all the first first stage of the translation is controlled by the insecure yellow one so the hideout needs to exist first and after the hideout is there the first thing we have to do is that we have to lift the host kernel through which we want to allow this execution of this new KVM best guests. We had to lift that thing to be a VM on its own. And already on majority of these mobile chips, chipsets, this is already a case to some extent. So the host is already a VM that is controlled by the hypervisor. So our hypervisor has to sit in the boot flow before this other hypervisors, and it has to be able to read and write the same page table information generated by that other thing. Uh, and then as mentioned already, it has to have this uh, arch architecture plumbing for dispatching the exceptions based on wherever they happen to be going. So some of, some of the exceptions have to be passed to the this, uh, SOC vendor hypervisor code. Some of them we handle ourselves and some of them we pass to the KVM. So but the KVM step is of course not required in this first step, but anyway, so it's, that's the whole construction. So after we have the, the host Linux itself running as a VM, 
we can we have to start building a system where we can protect pieces of that kernel's memory. So since that original host VM is it's it, it's a virtual machine, so we can read we have like full control over its view of the memory. So we have to provide plumbing for this kernel's protection. This was the first thing that we had in place around 2008, and this was already highly useful for all sorts of security as the use cases. And the way that we do this currently is that uh, we have first our hypervisor builds after the kernel itself, and the kernel is extended a tiny bit to reveal some of the memory information. So this ASM offsets.h, which is generated during the kernel build, is uh, we're adding elements to it. And this header, generated header, is basically inherited by the hypervisor build, so it, it knows and it understands the kernel structures. Then what we have, we also have a kernel driver, out of tree kernel driver, that can be loaded on that host kernel, and that will send the memory information, because, because a lot of the memory accesses are randomized during runtime. And this kernel driver, when it loads, it actually knows this information, how the kernel randomized things, so it will upload, load the information to our hypervisor during the early init call. Then, in addition to that, we're also patching the kernel tiny bit to align some of the protected data that needs protecting. Like kmalloc, as kmalloc is used for majority of the structure, relevant struct, structs in kernel, and it is really giving pretty poorly aligned stuff. And we had to uh, modify those kmalloc requests a tiny bit to get properly page, al page aligned entities so that we can protect things like, for example, BCPU register state. And then it's entirely valid question to ask at how this kind of approach works since kernel keeps evolving very fast. Well, it appears to work pretty well. So we have a pretty wide range of kernels, LTS kernels that we support. We don't support the development releases that is out of our scope, but we have a ready base patch from starting from 4.9 to 5.10 LTS release. And this doesn't actually require any changes in our code beyond this mentioned elements here. Then in order to work towards the secure KVM, we have to slice the KVM in two pieces. The first, we need to identify all the elements where the malicious host shouldn't be a, Malicious host kernel shouldn't be allowed to read or write, or actually write in most cases, it's fine if it reads some of these things. Uh, this, there's a, there's a list here. This is not the complete list. This is just a few of the most important elements that we are protecting by using the hypervisor when the guests, guest, guest execution is ongoing. Uh, the, most of them are probably pretty obvious what they mean, but the last one probably is not that clear. So we're what our hypervisor can do is that it can even lock the kernel's own page tables. Kernel generates its own page tables as it boots up. An attacker could basically go and modify those page by modifying those page tables. They could view as kind of a break kernel's own view of memory. And through that, they could do things like, for example, disable SC Linux or do any, any sorts of other nasty measures that we really want to protect against. So our hypervisor can even walk, locate the kernel page tables from the memory and protect those against the, uh, the modifications by the malicious host. So this is the set of things that ultimately require protections. More are listed on our web page. Uh, then the way that our construction works is that we're not altering the, the KVM's internal execution flows. They're pretty much all intact. 
But what we're doing is that we are overriding a bunch of the KVM Zoom balls that deal with this EL2 execution level stuff. And we're replacing them with our own symbols that are basically jumps to our hypervisor and requests for the hypervisor to do something. Rather than handling it in the kernel, we jump to the hypervisor and ask it to perform that same task for us. Uh, then uh, the last element in that list is the pretty important one. One of the things that we are trapping in the hypervisor is of course the MMU, not M MM, memory management notifier call, which will tell us that now there is some memory pressure on the device and the MM code wants to swap out the VM. And those cases we also handle in the hypervisor, they end up in the hypervisor and hypervisor knows if memory has been touched or not. So if the page is basically intact, the guest hasn't written any uh, potentially leaking information on the best page, it was just used as is coming from the host, then we allow it to be swapped freely, but we just take a SHA-256 measurement of the page and then unmap that page and allow the Linux to either preload it later on from the back, backing mapping or then even technically from the swap. Normal Linux doesn't swap if the page is clean, but anyway. Uh, for dirty guest pages, we currently don't allow unmapping, so we are not leaking the guest secrets by basically being aware of the page state. Later on, we could improve this tiny bit so that we could allow the Linux swap the dirty pages as well. We have to just add encryption support for it, and it should be pretty straightforward. It's just one work item among the many. Then Yanni will say a few words of this construction as a whole before we go a bit further and he will also mention how KVM self runs here. Thanks Yanni. <clears throat> this is a high level picture of uh, of all the all the blocks that we are we are talking about in this presentation and, and how those blocks are then divided to different exception levels. In this figure we see a uh, host operating system and, and two guest operating systems running on the same hardware and this uh, tiny hypervisor implementation we've been doing it sits there in the exception level two in the hypervisor mode and what has, has been changed to, to uh, existing KVM implementation is that, that uh, we took the ownership of the exception vector and uh, stage two translation tables, among other a little bit smaller stuff. And, and uh, we took that ownership because uh, as mentioned before, we, we needed to uh, make it possible for the for the for the two different uh, systems to coexist in the same system. Like KVM wanted to have the EL2 ownership, and and the SOC vendor implementation wanted to have the EL2 ownership. And to make that possible, we needed to create an implementation like this, so that actually we are the ones that own those EL2 features but uh, are able to hand the uh, ex uh, execution over to proper instance whenever needed and next slide we will tell a little bit more about that. So in, here we see uh, the how the KVM originally um, is uh, running in the system and uh, also how, how our uh, hypervisor implementation is, is uh, fitted into that picture by, by handling all the uh, EL2 mode exceptions and, and uh, uh, handling all the stage two memory translation. So for example, whenever there comes an exception from the host operating system, 
you're able to identify that exception and uh, hand the execution over to SOC vendor EL2 code. And in a similar way, whenever there comes an exception from the uh, guest operating system, we are able to identify that. Uh, and then hand the execution over to KVM implementation. And to mention uh, some of the most uh, painful implementation to do was here to uh, make the system work in a way that this SOC vendor EL2 code is able to work there in, in, a, in a proper manner because there are things like caching and, and uh, SMMU, SMMU and stuff that needs to take into consider, consideration. Um, handing back to Janne again. Yeah, so the this oral picture that Janine gave here is like it just doesn't really properly explain how some of these issues are so notoriously difficult to make work. But anyway, going forward. So I should have mentioned on the slide 12 that as our guests boot, the pages migrate slowly from the host to the guest. Uh, every time there's a, the guest walks on a page and that page may have loaded inform the information that it was loaded by the host, uh, that page is basically unmapped from the host entirely. So the host no longer has access to that page. This mechanism is pretty straightforward. It, the, there's just a clear page migration from the host and the host to the guest. The host self allocates the page, it fills it up, and then eventually when the guest walks on it, the page migrates to the guest. This is all nice, but then there's the difficult part that Vert.io is more or less mandatory on every single virtualization system because it's it's the key for any reasonable performance because it is all about making sure that the hypervisor doesn't need to trap on every access. Uh, Vert.io is difficult in the sense that Vert.io memory allocation is handled by the guest. The guest allocates random pieces of its own memory and then just decides to share that information to the host. And this is, uh, this is nice, but there's no way for the host or the hypervisor or anyone to know what these pages are. They're entirely random. So ultimately the responsibility for telling the, the hypervisor that which pages are to be shared for host guest communications are now on the guest's responsibility. But luckily for us, AMD, AMD got to this problem before us and we got to copy this approach. So, so the first uh, model how Vertio works here is that we hook into this same set memory decrypted call in the kernel that is done, that's also used by this SCB, and I think Intel TDX as well. So this is a function that where the whole, the guest kernel can say that this page should be opened for the host reading. Uh, this is one model that we support. Then we have another. So, so actually the, the previous model, the way that it works is it just generates a hypervisor call. So hypervisor will know which page basically to map back to the host and then all that will work just fine. But then we have another model which works for unpatched guests. The previous one will always require that there is a support in the guest kernel to open those pages. We have a model for that works with the unpatched guests also, but it's more or less time bound. So we lock the guest mappings uh, later after the guest has initialized. So before that, we allow the communications to happen. And because of that's tiny bit crazy in terms of when that window closes, then it's like the, the preferred mechanism is the number one. But number two is there in case you happen to be wanting to run on a modified guest. Take a Red Hat kernel and run it, it should be fine. And you can 
we call it blind date. Then that was basically all we had to do to get the KVM work in secure, in somewhat secure manner. The guests were separated from the host and the host, no matter what you do from the host, you cannot really write to the guest. That's all nice. And then in addition to that, we have a bunch of other useful memory protection. Some of these were already used before this KVM code came into existence. And some of these examples are shown by this hypervisor mode driver that we have in the R. We, we were about to link later there, the R GitHub repository where this code resides. There's a driver there that will show some of these samples. It will do things like protecting the kernel C runtime. It will lock the read only data and text sections of the kernel. It will lock this uh, kernel page table modifications so the kernel cannot alter its own mappings. Then uh, one big use case that we have is immutable kernel keys. So you can have things like file system encryption keys and the integrity measurement keys in the kernel, they can stay immutable and there's no way for attacker to ever modify them when the uh, same. Uh, then uh, another use, big use case currently under study is actually protecting the entire SC Linux rule set by pulling the SC Linux, Linux uh, memory SC Linux rule memory from a memory pool that is already protected by the hypervisor. So we can allow the rule creation and modification and everything during the device boot up time, but then later on we block the whole construction. And beyond that, we, we can also block these mappings from ever changing. So we can make this pretty hard construction. So here is the repository itself. The basically everything mentioned here has been implemented as a tiny KVM extension, all writing a lot of KVM symbols. Uh, doesn't really require much code modifications themselves, but it's not just some bunch of symbols need to be replaced. Uh, it controls all of the EL2 sensitive data and it protects bulk of it. The entire QMU and KVM APIs, user space APIs and everything is, it's all the same. So none of that, it's the changes all within KVM kernel functions. Uh, everything is pretty well happy path tested. It's very solid on the devices. Uh, we have given it like a pretty Pretty heavy shake and bake, it, it, it works. And if you want to give this a spin, let us know. We have basically support for basically all LTS kernels since 4.9, so we can provide a base patch against those things. And this whole construction has almost unlimited amount of use cases. And then a lot of them are under study. I think we have to kind of uh, set up a web page where we track this thing and kind of see, show the entire progress of that whole construction because the code that is out there is just the base plumbing giving possibility for many of these things like this this uh, secure KVM. Uh, and the our primary chipset that we currently support are are come from Qualcomm. We support multiple chipsets in there. Then we have a full support for QMU Vert 6 based system emulation model. So you can run this whole construction and see what it's doing in this kind of emulated environment. There's an SDK there uh, so that you can basically play and develop the whole construction further. I think we managed that goal of keeping the porting F port minimal. Because remember, one of the, our primary goals was to make sure that we can move this thing to a new mobile phone every time we get one. We 
with minimal effort without the entire operating system burden, just by utilizing the existing BSP or that was done for Linux for the particular chipset. So in order to move our code base between two different systems, the only thing you pretty much need to do is to uh, create the one C file and place that construction in your boot flow. That's basically all there is to it. There's really nothing more. It's very minimal. And the, even this word driver mentioned there is more or less optimal. It's only if you ever want to see output on your screen, on your serial console. There is a RAM lock in there that is wrecked by the driver itself. That's sufficient. You don't even have to do that. The kernel security framework works, and um, but the uh, I think one of our colleagues is about to update the kernel driver on the public kernel driver to be a bit more complete in terms of all the things that it's showing what to do with this stuff. The virtualization stuff overall is functional. It we are running Linux and Android guests with it. Uh, we are now in the process of making virtio GPU work correctly on ARM64 Android. I think this is something that even Google doesn't fully have. The Android's graphics pipeline is a bit of a mystery to many of us, so it's been a long reverse engineering exercise to make all that work, but it actually starts to you know, slowly draw things on the screen, so we're happy. And then the entire construction is waiting for full penetration testing, and we'd be very happy if you guys could browse the code and have a look at it and tell where it sucks and what the problem, if there are any considerable issues with the solutions security. Uh, there's a readme on that main page that will kind of uh, currently list the recognized if the issues that we recognize and if anyone is willing to send more, we are very happy to listen. Uh, so currently we don't have, unfortunately, any proper mailing list about this matter. We only have these private emails. And, and, but if this thing generates interest, if any one of you wants to start running your own secure KVM and hardening your kernel using the EL mo EL2 mode, we are here to help. So let us know and let's just set up a mailing list or something where we can talk about this stuff and how to get you to use this code. So now is the time for the QA. So I guess we're gonna stop here.